Okay, I gotta go, everybody. We're streaming. Uh, I think every everything should be good. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Pierre, and nice to meet everybody else. Yes, thanks, Michael.
Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we will begin in three minutes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Can I just have somebody confirm that the audio is working? Yes, it's working. Yeah, it's working okay. here as well. <clears throat> Great, thanks a lot. So uh, greetings, everybody, and welcome to this uh, very significant uh, release of information on the global impact of climate change uh, with the report Climate Vulnerability Monitor, A Planet on Fire. Uh, my name is Matthew McKinnon, and I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Ahmed, uh, and also uh, Mikhail Schaefer. We are with the Climate Vulnerable Forum and V20 Secretariat that's hosted in the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, the Global Center on Adaptation is um, an international organization focused on climate change adaptation and is chaired by uh, the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, uh, who is unfortunately unable to join us today. Some of you may be aware of the news regarding um, East Asia today, um, but uh, you will find his message in the report uh, regarding um, the information that's being released here today. The, um, this is a, a global assessment of the impact of climate change. 
It's a project that began uh, well over a year ago. It is commissioned by the Climate Vulnerable Forum and the V20, which represents 58 of the most climate threatened developing nations of the world and some 1.5 billion people. And it has been commissioned as an independent study uh, into the impact of climate change according to some specific terms of reference of the types of data that would be useful for CVF and V20 policymakers um, in their domestic and international engagements. So uh, by independently, we mean that it's formed of three separate sections, each focusing on different spheres of the impact of climate change. So in biophysical terms, in health terms, and in economic terms, and each of these uh, independent bodies of work were developed by uh, different uh, members of a research consortium. So for biophysical, that was climate analytics, for health, that has been the Lancet Countdown, and for the economic section, that is FINRAS. And um, what we're going to do today is hear from each of the lead authors and editors of those sections on the key findings. And afterwards, we will follow with um, a question and answer uh, session. You can, uh, I think everybody should be able to take the floor, but if you've just joined, it may take a few moments for you to be um, upgraded to be able to uh, speak when the time comes. So please raise your hand at that point. And you can also put questions into the chat. Um, I think everybody here probably would have received uh, the key findings of the report yesterday. And just prior to this conference, a copy of the advanced copy of the report, there might be some corrections and an and updated version um, addressing any of those uh, typographical errors and otherwise uh, by the end of the week, but essentially that's the report. And um, you, uh, you probably should have also received uh, the press release, uh, which summarizes some of the key info as well. So hopefully, although it's quite a substantial report and obviously a lot to digest um, in a short period of time, at least some of the key findings uh, are there and you will have an opportunity to, to hear also from directly from the authors and editors and to exchange with them. Uh, it's quite a unique piece of work. Maybe um, uh, it's, you would notice how it could differ a little bit from the IPCC and that it provides more specific and more granular information according to a, to a set framework of timeframes and warming periods. And it is a national database of information, although the data portal itself will be launched during the COP on the 10th of November next week. So please uh, look out for that. But because of the, the, the breadth of the analysis, most of uh, this report and the written version, the narrative is focusing on regional analysis in order to make um, the key findings more understandable. Uh, it does include some very exciting new data. Uh, for example, the global effect of uh, the economic impacts of climate change on interest rates and inflation. Uh, the Lancet is presenting its first projections on how major health risks that are affected by climate change will evolve during the course of the century. And uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of exciting information uh, to discover in the report, which, is, um, uh, which you will be hearing from uh, the different authors very shortly. We're gonna begin uh, with a message from the chair of the Vulnerable 20 Group of Ministers of Finance, the uh, Minister of Finance of Ghana. Um, if we can screen uh, the minister's uh, video. This is His Excellency Ken Oforiata. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, if uh, you can bear with us for a technical issue for a moment.
afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Accra. Over the last two decades, the V20 suffered wealth destruction of more than half a trillion US dollars due to climate change. The CVF and V20 commissioned this Climate Vulnerability Monitor third edition research project in order to make available a comprehensive data bank on the estimated future impact of climate change based on the latest scientific evidence and intergovernmental panel on climate change scenarios. Even if we can perfect methods in future, we need to know what the numbers are showing us in order not only to prepare but also to take action. The findings confirm the global injustice of the climate crisis of which we are already aware that those hardest hit are also those least responsible for and least equipped to tackle the crisis. The Climate Vulnerability Monitor also shows the extent to which the negative impacts will grow as we close in on 1.5 degrees Celsius, as well as how significant the avoided impacts will be versus higher levels of warming. We hope that the world will pay attention and use and act on the findings of the third edition of the Climate Vulnerable Monitor. Thus, the third edition of the Climate Vulnerable Monitor shows that the world should brace itself for rapid escalation in climate shocks. As 1.5 degrees centigrade is reached in the coming decade, we must prepare for the following impacts. An 8.5% projected global increase in human exposure on days of very high or extremely high wildfire danger. A 350% increase in the number of vulnerable people exposed to heat waves and consequently some 5 trillion more person hours of heat stress risk each year. And 12% of areas with no historic malaria suitability becoming new malaria transmission hotspots. The risks are piling up and economies need to be ready. Data and science points to the fact that inflation will be up by 66% if we breach 1.5 degrees centigrade. Inflation continues to disproportionately penalize V20 communities and economies that are still struggling to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic's direct and indirect shocks. Climate fuel risks have driven up the cost of capital and debt to unsustainable levels, especially across climate vulnerable economies, thus worsening financial protection gaps. In order to safeguard the 1.5 degrees centigrade safety limit of the Paris Agreement, it is critical that we commit to doubling funding for adaptation and also ensure the availability of prearranged finance. Such funds must be disbursed quickly and reliably before or just after disasters happen. We must resolve to expand instruments of adaptation and financial protection for governments, communities, businesses, and households. These will lower the impact of climate change, make vulnerable countries' economies more resilient, safeguard sustainable development, and protect lives and livelihoods of poor and vulnerable people. We therefore welcome the leadership of Germany to launch the Global Shield for Climate Risk next week in Sham El Sheikh. As we listen to the scientists today, I pray that it inspires in us a fierce sense of urgency to develop innovative protection instruments to uphold our common humanity and to protect all of us against the ravages of climate for world risk. Thank you. As uh, you heard from the Minister of Finance of Ghana, this is indeed the third edition of the Climate Vulnerability Monitor. There were two previous editions, and the last of which was actually published in 2012. Uh, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Tabe Lisner, who is uh, the um, lead editor and author on the side of clim climate analytics for the biophysical section of the report and um, the science consortium. Uh, that was convened for that effort. Uh, Taber, are you with us? Yes. Thank you. And thanks a lot for the opportunity to present some of our key findings. 
Let me just briefly make sure I can share my screen. And I hope you can all see um, my starting slide. Um, yes, well, thank you, Tabea. Perfect. Thanks. So, yes, my name is Tabea Lisner. I'm the Head of Vulnerability and Adaptation at Climate Analytics. And indeed, our um, team was leading on the analysis of biophysical indicators. And I would like to highlight some of the key findings um, of the report um, to highlight here at this meeting. To jump straight in, one of the very important things that the report and our analysis shows is that climate impacts are being observed across the world. Negative impacts of climate change can be seen across natural and human systems. In attribution research that we did for the Climate Vulnerability Monitor, we can show that there's trends and, uh, in temperature and precipitation that are caused by human activity. Using these trends, we can also assess the number of people impacted by these human-caused changes. Currently, around 85% of the global population live in areas that are already experiencing significant change in temperature and precipitation. It's very important to note that these numbers are likely underestimating the true extent. Around 18% of the population in CVF countries live in areas where we have severe data gaps that make it very difficult or even impossible to calculate the direct attribution. What's also very important to see is that vulnerable countries remain less visible in the scientific um, analysis of impacts despite a growing literature base. Using machine learning tools, we looked at the number of studies that show the impacts of climate change. And there's over 100,000 studies that we were able to assess. Looking at the per capita distribution, we see that in high income OECD countries, we have about 80 studies per million inhabitants. In CVF member countries, this is just above 22 studies per million inhabitants. So this really means that for the most vulnerable regions where the most severe impacts are currently being experienced, uh, we have much less visibility in the scientific literature. So it's ever more important to really have this, um, this report that shows the global highlights here. What the report also shows in much clarity is that climate impacts increase with every fraction of warming. So every degree of warming adds to mounting losses and damages from climate change. And this also increases the challenges to adaptation, especially for the most vulnerable regions. So even at 1.5 degrees of warming, vulnerable countries are likely to struggle to adapt to climate impacts as they are already severe. The changes that we report on in the CVM include, for example, average temperature increases and changes in precipitation patterns, but we also see significant increases in extremes such as droughts, for example. And this is visible on, on the panels that we show here on, on the slide. Um, impacts will also affect, for example, major staple crops with implications for food security. And there's regional noticeable hotspots that we identify in the report in the northern latitudes, but especially also in southern Africa across all indicators. What the report makes very clear is that limiting warming to 1.5 will minimize negative impacts that will be experienced. The report highlights the many projected global biophysical changes for 1.5 degrees versus the below 2 degree warming scenario, but it also shows the detrimental effects that unabated climate change would have under a no climate action scenario, which would lead to a median warming of around 2.6 degrees by the end of the century. Just to highlight one of the examples that we, we see here also on the slide, in a 1.5 degree scenario, the number of drought events in all regions of the world over a 20 year period is projected to increase four to eight fold by 2050 when compared to a current baseline. In a below two degree scenario, which would still not achieve emission reductions that are deep compatible with the Paris Agreement, um, this would rise to between five to 11 times. And under the no climate action scenario, this would e even increase to two to 12 to 14 times more frequent droughts. So it's very clear that limiting warming to 1.5 degrees not only reduces the potential for severe impacts, but it also provides a lot more clarity for planning of responses as the uncertainty range would be much, much lower at 1.5 degrees. It's very important to note that climate change also affects the socioeconomic conditions 
that determine the actual vulnerability on the ground and influence the overall level of climate risk that regions face. The 1.5 degree scenarios or compared to the no climate action scenario lead to drastically different outlooks in terms of socioeconomic conditions by the end of the 21st century. So the Paris Agreement's 1.5 temperature limit is not critical only for reducing the negative impacts of climate change, but it's also essential to spur improved socioeconomic conditions and to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In this context, we also looked at the very important aspect of adaptation and adaptation support, as this is, of course, essential to reduce climate impacts that um, we face even at present day levels, but of course also at 1.5 degrees of warming and associated impacts. What we see is that progress is being made in adaptation planning and also in implementation, but it's very uneven across sectors, and most uptake is documented in the economic and technological sectors. There's less investment in education, health, and environmental sectors, which are of course essential. What is very key to understand is that adaptation, even when it's effective, cannot reduce all losses and damages that we face from climate change. So to avert climate disaster, we must urgently get our emissions down and also undertake adaptation. So limiting warming to below 1.5 degrees is essential to reduce risk and to allow for adaptation and fund resilience development. So um, again, to sum up briefly, losses and damages as a consequence of climate change are occurring today and will continue to increase. And these impacts are often felt most acutely by the most vulnerable regions and population groups whose underlying socioeconomic conditions exacerbate increasing climate hazards. And the report really highlights the global responsibility to, adapt, to enable the most vulnerable to cope with these effects through adaptation and through building resilience. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much to Bear for presenting all of that information and thank you also to uh, remain on the line with us for any questions that might come. Uh, thank, many thanks to Climate Analytics for all their work uh, on this important piece of research. So I will now go to the Lancet Countdown and invite um, uh, Dr. Mar uh, Marina Romanello to uh, present uh, the the work and findings of the from the health section of the CVM3. Uh, Marina, are you with us? Hi, Matt. Yes, I'm with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks a lot. Matt, if you can just let me know when the screen has gone live. Yes, it's live. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. As Matt said, I'm the executive director for the Lancet Countdown, and we have been contributing to the um, monitor this year, tracking the future health impacts of climate change under different potential scenarios. Um, so I'm going to present to you some of the key findings of, of the report this year. But perhaps just to set the scene, some of the key takeaways from the health sector of this report, we're seeing climate-driven health risks increasing in all future scenarios, and that includes the 1.5 degree scenario. What that is telling us is that increased adaptation is crucial to protect the most vulnerable populations from exacerbated health impacts, which we are seeing already today. The second key message is that the increase in health impacts of climate change will be seen across the whole world in all countries. However, as we have heard already, the most vulnerable countries will be the most deeply affected and this is unless there's urgent action taken today to promote a just transition. And finally, we're seeing that accelerated climate action today can still prevent the most catastrophic health impacts of climate change in the near, medium and long term. So the work that I'm going to present to you comes from seven years of iterations and refinements of models that were developed by the Lancet Countdown and published in the Lancet Medical Journal. The Lancet, you might know, is the world's most influential scientific journal and the biggest medical journal in the world. And these models, we use them retrospectively at Lancet Countdown. We've just published our um, recent report and it shows that the impacts are already being felt today. So everything I'm gonna show you, it comes from peer reviewed um, scientific models. And I don't expect you to digest this figure, which is quite complex, but all I wanted to share with you is just the complexity of the climate change impacts uh, on health and the extent to which climate changes are affecting every dimension of the health and well-being of people today. 
And you can see here the indicators that we're monitoring in the, in the CDM3. We're looking at heat and health, at extreme weather events, at climate change and its effects on infectious disease transmission and risk, and the potential impacts on food insecurity. So I'm just going to show you uh, some of these key indicators, but obviously happy to answer questions also on any other of them. So turning to heat and health, obviously the, one of the most concerning impacts of climate change is the increase in exposure of vulnerable populations to heat waves and the associated increase in heat-related mortality. And what we're seeing is that without further adaptation, heat-related mortality could increase up to 1,550% with 3 million more annual deaths if we did not take action by the end of the century. This is under no uh, climate action scenario. However, perhaps the biggest message is that we could save 91% of those deaths if we were to take action today and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial times. Obviously, these impacts do not manifest themselves uniformly around the world. And we see that the most affected regions are expected to be South Asia, with enormous increases in exposure to, to extremes of heat and associated heat-related mortality. And the poorest, hottest areas of the world are of course expected to see unlivable uh, heat conditions. Turning to infectious diseases, this is another area where climate change is becoming a great concern by changing the temperature, humidity, and rainfall patterns. We're also starting to affect our exposure to climate-sensitive infectious diseases. And I'm showing you here as an example of that, the risk of dengue transmission. We're evaluating the extent to which the changing weather will increase the R0, the reproduction potential of dengue, and therefore exposing populations to emerging risks. As you can see in the map, even under a 1.5 degree comp compatible scenario, areas that today are endemic and where today dengue is a, a, um, a disease of public health concern, like South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, will see the potential for transmission of dengue increasing, even under a 1.5 degree scenario. Obviously, as we approach two degrees, this increase is much exacerbated. And if we were not to take any climate action, we would see enormous increases in South America and Asia in particular, also in Southeast Asia. But perhaps what is important to note is that areas that today are free from the disease, like the North America, like Europe, would start seeing conditions that would be increasingly suitable for outbreaks of dengue. So we're talking about emerging diseases and new populations being exposed to diseases that today were considered um, relatively protected from. Obviously, we're seeing here a decrease. You can see in blue some areas that show a relative decrease in what we consider today to be a risk of dengue. But it's important to note that the vector, the mosquito, and the pathogen, the virus, can both adapt to, to changing conditions once they're established. So probably this is what we model today, but the biology of the pathogen and its transmission is set to change. So this is uh, just to highlight, it's not that we would be safer in those areas, or at least not that we know of. Turning a bit to extreme weather events, obviously we will see drier, hotter conditions in many parts of the world. And one of the particular concerns with this situation is increasing exposure to wildfires that we know affects our health, both through direct burns and injury, as well as exposure to wildfire smoke and the associated respiratory um, conditions that it triggers, as well as um, eye irritation and conjunctival irritation that comes with that. Um, and obviously exposure to um, wildfires can have side effects in terms of destruction of essential infrastructure and essential services. So what we're monitoring here is the change in the population exposure to wildfire risk or to days of very high wildfire risk. And once again, the pattern is very similar. Under a 1.5 degree compatible scenario, we do expect to see an increase in the exposure of populations to um, days of high wildfire risks. We can see areas, particularly in hotter latitudes, seeing exacerbated risks of um, wildfire exposure. Under the two degree scenario towards the end of the century, this increases, but obviously if we were to not take any climate action, we would see an enormous increase, um, particularly in Africa in hotter areas in Central America, in the Middle East, in terms of that exposure to wildfires. So this poses an acute health risk that needs to be managed and mitigated. And finally, 
turning to climate change and food insecurity. We know that climate change is already today affecting global food security. We have data showing how the heat wave increases that we've seen over the past decades have resulted in almost 100 million more people self-reporting food insecurity today. And what we're seeing here as well is that as the climate warms, we're gonna see more and more people reporting um, severe food insecurity as a result of the exposure to heat waves. This is particularly true if we were not to take any climate action and it's a result both of reduction of crop yields and of reduction of uh, purchase power in terms of food access. Perhaps of particular concern is that some areas of the world which today are already suffering from um, acute food insecurity, like many African countries we're seeing, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Central African Republic, Somalia, uh, and other low human development index countries are set to see the highest increases in food insecurity relating to the increasing temperatures. So again, while no country is exempt, we can see the Nordic countries being highly affected by increasing food insecurity. It is once again, those most vulnerable countries, generally those in, in hotter latitudes that are gonna see the effects the most. So just to reiterate the, the, the messages, we're seeing an increase an increasing climate driven health risks Adaptation is absolutely crucial. Even at 1.5 degrees, we're gonna see exacerbation of climate change impacts on health if we don't urgently adapt. And while not, no country is exempt, the most vulnerable countries are said to suffer the highest impacts unless we promote a just transition. So today we can still avoid much of these impacts in the future by uh, undertaking accelerated efforts to maintain global world temperatures under 1.5 degrees. And with that, I just thank you very much and pass over back to Matt and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you so much, Marina, and thank you for presenting that enormous body of work um, so succinctly. And also, uh, the Lancet Countdown was joining the research consortium only this year, so it, we do know just how much an incredible body of work and the dozens of experts that you have brought together behind this in order to provide that contribution to the CDM3 and to put those projections forward. Uh, so thank you very much and to all of the different experts that collaborated uh, to get us to this point. Thank you, Marina. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to turn to um, the Florent Bausch, who is with uh, the head of FINRES, and he's going to present the economic section uh, of the Climate Vulnerability Monitor 3. Uh, Florent, you have the floor. Thank you, Matthew. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for involving us in this uh, amazing research. And we are very pleased today to present you the results from the economic analysis. Um, I would like to start by what we keep on learning event after event um, is that climate-related disasters negatively affect economic growth and also escalate, escalate inflation across countries. Since both these indicators, economic growth and inflation, are key parameters influencing the definition of interest rates by central banks, the report also sheds some lights on the potential consequences of climate change on the cost of borrowing across countries. The, to understand the extent to which climate change is projected to alter macroeconomic indicators, the economic analysis that we developed under the CVM um, looked at country level analysis of these three parameters that you have here on your screen, GDP growth per capita, inflation that we know are directly, directly affected by climate related disasters, and then in turn, interest rates. For the deviation in GDP per capita growth and also in inflation from climate change, the method that we applied is from a peer reviewed method published in 2020 in World Development, the leading scientific journal in development economics. For the analysis on interest rates, we rely on a well-known rule, which is called the Taylor Rule, developed in 1993, that relate changes in GDP and changes in inflation to interest rates. So central banks actually in low to high income countries implicitly or explicitly apply this rule in the definition of interest rates. In this analysis, there are two key sets of findings that we have coming out of the CVM. First is that at all level of warmings, um, analyzed under this work, climate change will have detrimental macroeconomic consequences. What we see clearly across all nations is that we will have lower than expected 
incomes across all nations, higher inflation that together will translate most likely in a depreciation of people's living conditions. Combined with increased interest rates, government households and government and households, we have a limited ability to invest in sustainable development, mitigation and adaptation at the required scale. What we see in terms of GDP per capita is that we expect to decrease GDP per capita growth, but will lead to lower incomes across all countries with some countries, especially the ones located in Central Asia, facing up to 30% decrease in their growth potential. With more um, frequent precipitation extremes affecting countries, price are also projected to increase. Across all nations, the study finds inflationary trends from limited from limited level below uh, below one percent in median in North and South America to near in the near term to two point four in Asia and Africa in the long term. So this is what you see currently on the map aggregated across the continents. As a response to more variable GDP growth and also increasing inflation, interest rates are also projected to increase across all regions. Um, what we found, for example, is measures in basis points. This is the measure of interest points. We find that the median interest rates could climb up to 60 points, basis points in on the Asian continent, for example, by the end of the century. The second set of um, information that we find coming out of this report is that keeping global mean temperature well below or below 1.5 degree will have a margin large macroeconomic benefits. On average, across all continents, the additional 0.5 degree of warming by reaching two degrees would, would lead to more than a doubling in the negative macroeconomic consequences of climate change on incomes compared to those observed at 1.5 degrees of warming. And with the climate negotiations starting again in, in a week from, from now, almost a week, we are very convinced that these results can guide the talks and help contribute increased ambition in line with the Paris Agreement objective of keeping global mean temperature increase well below 2 degrees and in line with 1.5. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, the, the CVF. Thank you very much, Florent, for presenting that, that really um, innovative analysis underpinned by peer-reviewed research and, and um, uh, prevailing economic theories you have pointed out. Uh, I think that concludes uh, the three segments of the report. So we have this clear picture now of the present, medium-term and long-term climate change loss and damage that we can expect to face uh, depending on different uh, mitigation scenario outcomes. And in the absence uh, of um, other measures in terms of adaptation and addressing loss of damage. So uh, with that, we would um, uh, have some time to be able to take uh, questions from interested um, uh, participants and uh, members of the uh, media who have been invited to, to join the call. So. Um, I, I believe it's possible, right, to, that, that they can, you can raise your hand or use the chat. Is it the, the, the chat is also available. Um, uh, sorry, is it the Q&A function? The Q&A function, or you can raise your hand uh, if you would like to uh, take the floor.
Matt, I think we have a question in the chat. Okay, so um, I think probably some of you can read that in the chat, but uh, what is the CVM3 offering amid the flood of reports that is coming through in advance of COP27, which uh, begins actually on, uh, at the start of next week? So um, maybe I can invite uh, in reverse order, um, Florent, then Marina, then Tabea to respond to this question. Uh, with any thoughts that you'd like to offer on how uh, this report distinguishes itself from other reports that are coming out this and week and, and the week prior, uh, from, from an economic perspective. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. I, I wasn't going to respond on an economic perspective. I was going to say comprehensiveness. Uh, so it's not an economic perspective. Um, I I think what's the I've, I've, I'm trying to follow all the, the flood of report that you're referring to um, in the chat. Um, as far as I'm aware, there was no real publication on the economic impacts of climate change lately being published, even less so going all the way down from like in, going to interest rates. So I hope I hope it's a very useful contribution to the debate, as I was saying. What we see, and maybe let, I need to insist again on that, is um, the macroeconomic conditions across all countries developed or low and middle income, high income countries will be extremely complex. Um, and the best, the most viable economic strategy that we have at hand at the moment is keeping uh, global mean temperature increase below 1.5 degrees. Um, and I'm not sure there is any comprehensive or as comprehensive analysis um, available in that flood of reports uh, that actually provides such a picture from beginning of the biophysical impacts to the health impacts to the economic impacts. But I, I leave it to my to my other colleagues as well. Thanks a lot, Florent, for that perspective. Uh, Marina, can we go to you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for that question. It's very important because we're receiving so much information these days. Um, and it's quite important to know what the added value of the different reports are. From the health perspective, there's probably two reports coming out. One is the Lancet Counter Report, the other one is the CDF report, and there's not really much more. And what we do at Lancet Counter is retrospective assessments, whereas what is the novelty and perhaps the, the value of this report is that it's allowing us to project what the world could look like and what it is that we need to spare ourselves from by acting today. So in that sense, it's enormously valuable to be able to understand what is really at play today. Uh, as we head down to COP. So there's not really much more out there. Um, you probably will want to look at the WHO also trying to, to, to assess some monitoring, but this projections is pretty unique. And having it in the monitor that will be released at COP at a country level will also hopefully be a good resource for countries to be able to assess what are the risks that we need to be protecting from and do a cost benefit analysis that is informed by scientific data in looking at um, actions taken forward. Thank you, Matt. I hand over to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Marina. And uh, now I'll just move to, uh, to Bea uh, to respond. And then I think we have some more uh, comments after that to come to, to Bea. Yes, thanks a lot for this uh, excellent um, question and to add from, to what my colleagues have said. I think it's a very unique resource in setting the stage for this upcoming COP to really drive home the sense of urgency of how important it is to limit warming to 1.5 degrees to really outline at a national level how different the world would look if we don't um, stick to the 1.5 uh, warming level. Um, also through the national level analysis, as was mentioned, but also through the unique focus on the most vulnerable and the developing world that will, of course, be um, center stage for this COP as well. Thank you very much, uh, Tabe. Uh, we have a hand raised, I think, from Laura App. Do you want to take the floor, Laura App? Is that her? No, there's a long message. Oh. It's a message, and it says, I should show you the screenshot if you want, mm -hmm. but it says, um, Natalie Castro here from the Philippines, which was recently devastated by a severe tropical storm over the weekend. 
What does this report mean to COP27? Will this amplify the debt problem of vulnerable countries? Uh, so a question focused on debt. Maybe Florent, can you see that? Do you want to take that question? Yes. Um, thank you, Matthew, Matthew, and thank you, Nasrin Castro, for the question. Um, what does this report mean for COP27? I think we tried to answer as much as we could to this question through what Tabea said and also Marina just before. I think it's really providing evidence that 1.5 is the most viable um, diplomatic, economic, and social strategy, not just for vulnerable nations, but also for like higher income nations, high income nations across the globe. So I hope it's it's a very clear finding of the report. And then the question on will this simplify the debt problem in vulnerable countries? Unfortunately, I think the answer is yes. Um, and it's not will, is, is it already amplifying the problem across countries for debt burden? This is already the case. And unfortunately, the, the type of instruments that we have currently available to address these kind of issues is naturally um, at the scale of the problem. I know, and as the minister was talking about, there is some initiatives such as Global global, uh, global Shield, sorry. There's also other initiative that looks like, for example, like catastrophe bonds and so on and so forth. But the findings that we have from the report really raise the question of whether this is enough first and whether the, the current system as, as it works through the debt, to pay for development, to pay for adaptation, to pay for loss and damage is the most adapted system. What will happen in the Philippines if you have more frequent climate-related disasters that actually disrupt your economy? How is the government going to respond to that? What are the tools which is avail what are available to the government? And unfortunately, at this stage, we have very limited uh, tools available. And when they are available, there is also a question of skill. It's, it's very good what is everything is which is available but i think we need to stop prototyping and now we need to start implementing at state at, at scale and it's very much what the negotiations are going to look into in in a week in sharma share at the cop 27. thanks a lot Flo. i'll also uh invite uh sarah sarah here as she's the coordinator of the secretary's work with the finance ministers of the v20 so just a further comment on that last question, Sarah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the question on debt. Um, so currently, the V20's uh, debt servicing payments for the next six years is more than half a trillion US dollars, uh, which means that increases to the cost of capital, inflation, currency depreciation will impact how much this is. Um, and it's critical now that we find solutions to deal with the cost of capital issues so that uh, developing countries, the V20, can invest this decade in adaptation, resilience, the low carbon transition, and also to deal with loss and damage. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So I don't know if uh, Laura, who had the hand up earlier, if, if there's a technical issue or you would like to still come in. Uh, click on attendees again. Check um, Laura, I see your hand up. In case you want to unmute your mic, you can come in. Um, I think your your mic is still on mute, Laura, in case you want to come in. We see your hand up. Okay, well, um, I think if there's any other questions, we could still take those for a few more minutes. Um, in order to just uh, give some concluding thoughts, then we would move to uh, colleague Mikhail Schaefer, who has been the uh, lead scientific uh, editor on our side for this project. 
Um, so we'll just give it another second. And then if there's nothing, we'll move to Mikhail for wrap up thoughts before we close the press conference. Okay, so I think that's uh, it for the questions. Um, could I please invite Dr. McKeel Schaefer to uh, take the floor for a, a final closing comment, please? McKeel. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, and uh, and all the uh, the authors uh, that have been working on the on the report. Um, I just wanted to to share one final thought as we go into COP twenty seven, which is about uh, the warming limits. That have been assessed in the report. Uh, several authors uh, highlighted the fact that 1.5 degrees is an important limit and then there are real differences between the 1.5 degree level of warming and the other warming levels assessed in the report. And the reason I want to point this out is that um, so we have a 1.5 degree warming level, we have a, a no action scenario which leads to almost four degrees, but then what is called in the uh, report as a below two degree limit is different from what is in the Paris Agreement, which of course is a well below two degree li limit. And I want to point this out because uh, there's a lot of um, uh, ongoing discussion about interpretation of the Paris Agreement. And I think it's very important that this, re this report shows that if let's say not the full Paris Agreement the meaning of well below two degrees is taken into account and we end up with some something which is you know seems semantically close um as as uh, you know below two degrees that the data shows that there is an actual real difference in the impacts in the damages which are much more serious um compared to 1.5 degrees that's the only thought i wanted to add today and i thank everybody for their attention Thank you very much, Mikhail. An important closing thought indeed. So uh, with that, that will bring us to the close of um, uh, the press conference on the release of this report. You can find it on the uh, website of the V20. I uh, would request colleagues to put uh, the link into the Zoom chat. And uh, that link will also provide access to the full data portal, which will go live on the 10th of November uh, next week. So um, please stay tuned for that. And if you have any questions, uh, once going through the material, um, the media team will be very happy to direct your questions to the different experts. And we will endeavor to respond to any questions as soon as possible. So. Thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you to all the panelists and to each of the research teams for their contributions and um, wishing you a very good day.